Thank you, Ursula. And yeah, I'm, I'm really flattered to open the, this whole event. And it's really a, a big event, I would say, because it's, it's not very common. Actually, this might be the very first time that there is this kind of lecture series that are so cross and transdisciplinary. Um, I'm currently heading a UNESCO committee where we look into how universities can promote the sustainability goals worldwide, also within the universities, of course. And, and one, one of the things we really discussed there is how to deal with these uh, silos in science, how to come about for cross and transdisciplinary uh, efforts like this one. So it, in itself, this is a great achievement. Um, so um, my lecture will be basically on the natural science part. Um, seems like I have to reopen this. So there we are. So it will be about tipping points uh, in nature and with a bit smaller letters in culture because it will be basically about nature. But the point is here that there is this intimate link between the risk of tipping points in nature and the need for tipping points or at least changes in culture. So I'll come back to the, the very concept of tipping points, which might be rare, but, uh, but still important. Uh, and, uh, but probably they, uh, it's important to state that they, re they relate to um, feedback systems. Uh, and I will touch upon these as well. But as you might see, I'm not only at the professor at the Institute of Bioscience, I'm also head of a center that we actually have called Center for Biogeochemistry in the Anthropocene. Um, it's a, it's a somehow a cross disciplinary event in itself, this center, but it's still within the natural sciences. It's people that work with the atmospheric chemistry, climate modeling, um, chemistry related to climate, the geology related to climate, and of course, biology. But still, even within uh, these three institutes uh, at the same faculty, we see that uh, it's, it's really a, a struggle to cross boundaries here. Yeah, I've also been writing this, written this book as already stated, that was a small commercial from my side. We all know that there are planetary boundaries and that many of these boundaries uh, are about to be uh, trespassed and, and some are, in, in some cases, we are already way above. Um, and these, of course, are uh, the reasons why we are discussing this concept, concept of the Anthropocene. And it's about to be accepted as a, as a true era, but whether or not it's accepted, it's not the point. The point is that we actually are discussing this. By the way, Paul Kurtzen, who named this, as you said, Ursula, he passed away last week, so that's um, quite a coincidence. But he was a tremendously influential uh, atmospheric chemist who also discovered uh, and, and suggested how we should deal with the, the depletion of the ozone layer. So there are many reasons why we can discuss the, the, this new era and why we have uh, are agreed that it's about to rename the, the, this into a new, giving it a new, to give it a new name after humans. And of course, the most obvious is the CO2 concentration that we have changed the atmosphere, not dramatically when it comes to important gases like CO2 uh, and oxygen and nitrogen, but for CO2, it's still sufficient to have created this um, warming effect that we are now uh, well into already. So uh, CO2 concentration have now exceeded for 10 ppm. We are heading towards uh, 420 and uh, it will definitely not stop there. Uh, there is also remaining capacity amounting to 800 gigaton of CO2 
the number itself might not be important, but with at least the rates of emission from 2019, they were slightly lower actually in last year, thanks to COVID-19, but the 2019, uh, uh, 2019 emission uh, would mean that uh, we have less than 10 years before we pass uh, 1.5 degree and a few more decades then we have also passed two degrees warming so that's just one sign and of course not the trivial one either uh, but it's important to remain uh, to, to recall that this is not only in quote markets then uh, about climate and co2 it's also about the degradation and of nature uh, loss of important ecosystem and of course loss of biodiversity and these things are linked together, as I will show the, the reason why we, at least one of the reasons why we should keep large intact systems of uh, nature in, in well-functioning ecosystems is that it's very important for the climate situation itself. Just one telling news is that we have uh, on average uh, reduced the, the populations of vertebrates for those that we have long-term records with sufficiently numbers by 60 percent within four decades i mean this is truly alarming it should not be mixed up with the uh, extinctions but these are loss of population side it means that there are simply less animals and the reasons is straightforward it's because there are more humans and we are spreading around and using the the planetary surface for our own means and uh, kind of uh, it's probably not right to call it fun fact but at least the fact is that the ratio between terrestrial vertebrates is like you can see here humans as this single species make up 36 percent or domestic animals 60 percent and what remains to wild animals from most to elephant is then four percent it looks a bit different if you include the invertebrates like insects but um, uh, i think this again is a pretty good sign how much we are actually using of the planetary resources. And we have, of course, degraded wetlands, forest, land service, coastal systems dramatically. Uh, and on top of this comes then the, uh, the actually loss of species, species extinctions, for which the, the numbers are more insecure. This and much more sums up to what the Global Footprint Network has calculated as Earth Overshoot Day. Actually, it should probably be called the undershoot day. It's the day of the year where we have by these indicators and many more used the productivity capacity and also the recipient capacity of the planet for uh, that year. And these dates typically comes earlier for each year. Uh, in 2019, this overshoot day arrived at 29th of July meaning that the rest of the year we're actually not even borrowing, but stealing from uh, common, uh, coming generations. Last year, actually, the, the day was in mid-August, showing the positive impact by uh, COVID-19. But the point is that this positive COVID-19, unwanted <laughs> COVID-19 effect, has to be continued for the next three decades if we should reach the, the target for climate change. It's also important to, to recall that if we apply this uh, calculation for Norway, for instance, this Earth Overshoot Day would have arrived uh, in um, mid-April. So, of course, we have this gross inequality in, in resource use. Uh, yeah, there are many things to dispute when it comes to climate, but uh, the most important things are undisputable. And that is uh, first and foremost, of course, the, this uh, rise, steady in rise in CO2. Uh, the record started in 1958. Uh, this is the longest record from Moana Lua, Hawaii. And we see this steady increase in, in CO2. Uh, Already in 62, 63, uh, David Keeling, who, who started this um, uh, monitoring, gathered some colleagues discussing uh, why they observed this rise in CO2. And they come up with the only single explanation was human use of fossil fuels. So this is a story that uh, has been known for a long time. And since the greenhouse impact effect, 
by certain gases, not the least CO2, was then already known for 150 years. They also warned at that time, uh, 60 years ago, that uh, with the current increase of CO2, this could also imply a, a dangerous heating of the planet. Uh, yeah, the reason why there are some ups and downs here are because the planet uh, inhales CO2 by photosynthesis uh, in the northern hemisphere in summertime and exhales uh, this as CO2 uh, during winter and, and late fall, thanks to respiration and degradation. So, but the point is here that there is this steady increase uh, of CO2. And of course, this is a worldwide uh, phenomenon, not only something that happens at uh, Hawaii. Uh, this is a kind of symbolic picture. I was doing field work at Svalbard last year. We did eDNA sampling and also measured greenhouse gases in different environments. And this is outside the New Olesund, and this was the first time I witnessed a collapse of the permafrost up there. There is icy grounds here, but uh, when the permafrost uh, thaw, uh, the ground might collapse like it has done here. But on the mountain behind there is the station, the Norwegian monitoring station at the Zeppelin Mountain, which was the first station worldwide that recorded 400 ppm. So that's a kind of symbolic uh, image uh, with the permafrost melting in foreground. Uh, we also know pretty well what uh, creates heating and what creates cooling. And uh, there is no real discussion that CO2 is uh, by and large the, the key player here. But then we have these other greenhouse gases like methane, which I will say a few words about later on. Also nitrous oxide, which is increasing because we have also drastically changed the nitrogen, global nitrogen cycle. And there are also some other smaller gases that contribute here. Uh, yeah, ozone might, uh, at least ground, uh, near ground ozone actually might play a role as well. Uh, and then there are some small players uh, further down here, and we have some uh, players that give uh, contributors on the negative side, the, the blue bars here, not the least the aerosols. And of course, that's a big question these days when we see that also the aerosol emission have dropped thanks to COVID-19 again. Will this actually heat up the planet because this cooling impact of the aerosol has, has dropped? Aerosols is also tremendously important in cloud formation. So um, yeah, that's an important part of this. Uh, solar irradiance at the very bottom here has a very small contribution as the situation is today. So by and large, this is driven by anthropogenic uh, forcing. The, the sum of this is the yellow bar. And again, this is uh, uh, hardly disputable. We also know quite a bit about the, the, the gases in prehistoric times, thanks to drilling in the ice at the, in the Greenland ice sheet and in Tar Antarctica, when the ice freezes, it traps the air uh, around and creates a kind of a fossilized uh, uh, track of the, the atmosphere in those days. And the, Ice course goes all the way back 850 years. We see that during this uh, enormous time span covering ice edges, uh, ice <laughs> edges and, um, and warm periods in between, C2 has just varied between 200 and 280 ppm. So we're now really heading into unknown territory. Uh, and we probably need to go two, three, four million years back before we have a CO2 level like that we have today. And we are in the worst case heading towards uh, a situation that we had in the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum 55 million years ago when the global temperature reached more than five degrees uh, above today, which is unlikely, but still not uh, completely unthinkable. So. That's the question. Will this uh, reach the peak around 550, a doubling of uh, prehistoric um, CO2, or will we even creep up against 1000 ppm? And then a very important take home message, and that is that Earth is truly a specific planet. Uh, it's thermodynamically unstable, and this is thanks to biology. 
or neighboring planets like Mars and Venus are for all practical means dead planets with sky high levels of CO2, very little nitrogen, and of course, most important, almost zero oxygen. This was also the situation at the, our planet in the very beginning, but then life itself gradually changed this over billions of years uh, and uh, created this ideal situation with uh, around 400 or 0.4% CO2, uh, some methane and some nitrous oxide, uh, uh, then high levels of uh, nitrogen and the ideal concentrations of oxygen of 21%. And this together creates 15 degrees as average global temperature, thanks to the a small greenhouse impact. So CO2 is good, of course, both for plants and for creating a, a modest greenhouse effect. The problem is, of course, when there is too much of a good thing, just like plastics, and that's what is what happening with CO2 right now. But I mean, this is very important because it shows the, the role of life, both in prehistoric times for creating the kind of planet we have today with the, the right climate for life, and the right level of oxygen. And it also is important for understanding how life is imperative for regulating the climate on this planet also in the, the future. Yeah, very briefly, this is a, a anticipated change in the gas con concentrations. Um, there was a period with really high levels of oxygen and then a depression, but uh, in human history and before that, it has been pretty stable around 21%. Yeah, oxygen started to be produced by small phytoplankton and some of these create these colonies um, that some of these are still active. Not the same, of course, that were active uh, 3 billion years ago, but the same type of organisms. These are blue-green uh, phytoplankton, blue, no phytoplankton, no, but blue-green bacteria that uh, creates oxygen by photosynthesis. And these and later on others gradually changed oxygen levels up to the pleasant level. And if you play a movie on of life on Earth, it would be incredibly boring until we reach this so-called Cambrian explosion around uh, 500 million years from now, where oxygen had reached a level where life really took on. And most of these bizarre uh, multicellular forms of life appeared, likely due to the fact that oxygen had evolved to a sufficient level to sustain higher life. Yeah, there were even periods with peak levels of oxygen when we had these monstrous insects with wingspans of one meter, etc., millipedes of a meter, etc. So they were powered by high oxygen levels. Then there are things that regulate climate on Earth, and we have a very slow and coarse thermostat driven by geology, and uh, by and large. Uh, when rock is withering, CO2 is drawn down, and this cools the planet. When it's cooled sufficiently, ice starts to expand, and in, there's been a couple of cases where we have almost had a completely ice-covered planet, fortunately only almost. Then the other side of the equation, the, the CO2 emissions from volcanic activity and plate tectonics have released CO2, and these have then gradually built up the CO2 in the atmosphere, heating the planet and the ice have then withdraw and the weathering of rocks again has started and this has been a kind of very slow pendulum that still is active but uh, today it's this process uh, these processes that are most important this is the most important graph i will show today and it explains uh, or not really graph but the illustration it shows the tremendous importance of natural ecosystems, what we could call the largest, by far the largest ecosystem services, namely the role of photosynthesis for taking up and sequestering CO2 from the atmosphere. So the red numbers here are our emissions, less than half of this remains in the atmosphere. Still that is sufficient to create, create this rise in CO2, but more than 50% is taken up by vegetation and plants on land and in the ocean. And some of these are buried deep down uh, and this net uptake of CO2 is tremendously important. If the planet heats up, if we 
cut the forest or it, it's burned and uh, for instance the internal hydrological cycle of the amazon is broken in fact the amazon could itself reach a tipping point uh, turn into a kind of savanna where all the carbon buried in trees and, and uh, trunks would then be emitted to the atmosphere similarly if we uh, heat up the arctic tundra uh, lots of carbon is stored there in the permafrost also, we now see uh, increased incidence of, of fires at the, in the high north, in permafrost areas in northern forest, which again re releases tremendous amounts of CO2. And that is also a kind of dangerous feedback process because less forest, more thawing on permafrost creates more CO2, in the worst case also more methane from the permafrost which again heats up the planet and we see how this escalates. And in the worst case, it might escalate into a, a kind of a, a regional or even global tipping point. The same with oceans, when they heat up as they do uh, and become more acidic as they also do, they will also be less able to uh, take up and sequester CO2. So these are uh, in a nutshell why healthy ecosystems are extremely important also for climate. Yeah, just a reminder that this is uh, not only about CO2 and, and climate, of course, the, the problem is that we are overusing the global capacity, we are overusing the Earth's surface, and this again has to do with uh, what we eat, what we uh, spend, uh, what we release, uh, actually the, the human lifestyle. And the question is, oh, well, this turns up in Norwegian, but I guess you, uh, most of you can understand it. How bad can it be and will it eventually pass over? Uh, the problematic thing is that it's really hard to tell how bad things might be. Uh, the worst case scenarios here, the, the red curve brings us all the way up to uh, yeah, around five degrees. And this already is 79 years from now. This is as far as the most predictions go. In the best case, the blue curve, we will uh, enter a stabilized Earth and, uh, and really uh, avoid the, the harmful uh, the heating. Uh, today, we are heading towards something in between the gray or black and, um, and, and the yellow curves around 2.5 or even higher degrees. Uh, the reason why this is hard to predict is not because the climate model is uh, uh, behaves badly. Actually, when you run them backwards, they are quite capable of tracking past the uh, climate. But it has to do with how the ecosystems respond. As I said, we, as I said, will the forest still be able to take up CO two? Will the permafrost hold, still holds its tremendous stores of carbon? Uh, will the ocean act as a sink of CO two? That's one side. And the other is how will society uh, respond? What kind of new technology, what kind of new uh, ways of living, uh, new norms, new economy, etc. Uh, can we invent to change this? Or in another word, how, what kind of social tipping points can we invoke to, to prevent these most dramatic uh, effects here? So what is actually a tipping point? And Tipping points are probably quite rare, but we can see them locally and also regionally, and in, both in society and in nature. And the point is that if you stress or change a system, nothing will often happen to a certain degree. It seems to be pretty smooth, or eventually you have a gradual decay or some of some type of functioning. Then suddenly you hit a kind of unstabilizing uh, era where area where things flip over and you can enter then a new stable state. Uh, this is another way of showing this, a kind of mar marble in cup uh, cartoon. The system is uh, stable in the sense that you can perturb it, but it will still go back to the, the where it started. And this can go on for quite some time when you stress the system even more, but at some point then you have this flip over to another, a new uh, stable steady state where it's very hard to, to get back the cold hysteresis. So in our center we are studying these feedbacks which eventually might turn into tipping points in northern system, uh, the ice sheets, the, 
the permafrost, the, the boreal forests, and also the oceans. I mean, one of the most dangerous tipping points is, of course, if the North Atlantic current change, if the so-called Gulf Stream are weakened or even stops before it comes to Northern Europe, that would have tremendous impact. So, and of course, the really, uh, really worst case horror scenario is if we enter a kind of planetary threshold that brings us into a hot tall cert, which again is extremely unlikely, but, uh, but it might happen. But uh, what we should aim for is, of course, to, to reach a kind of slightly warmer but, but stabilized Earth. But as this is, I think, one of the papers you've got to read, climate points, tipping points, too risky to bet against, as Tim Lenton has, uh, has been writing, and I, of course, completely agree. Yeah, this is just one type of course tipping points if the permafrost suddenly start to, to melt. It's, this is nothing that will happen from one day to another, but it might be an escalating type of feedback. And it might also release methane. I will not go into the methane story because time is running, but the methane is of course also a very important player in the carbon cycle because methane is CH4, and this is also something that we strongly have perturbed. And uh, historically, CO2, methane, and temperature are very closely correlated. And this raises kind of hen and egg uh, question. Is it so that temperature change comes first and then secondary uh, comes the rise in CO2 and methane? Well, that has probably happened before. I mean, there are many things that historically have heated up the planet. Um, but today it's quite widely accepted that the emissions of CO2 and methane comes first and then temperature comes secondary. But the, the nasty thing here is of course that temperature will in itself be able to speed up a further release of CO2 and methane from ecosystems. So this is a, could be a kind of vicious cycle that would not turn the planet into a dead planet. I mean, the Earth is pretty robust, so the Earth will survive and, and likely humans too, uh, but uh, not in the kind of nice situation that most of us experience today. Then, yeah, another Norwegian headline, sorry, but the, the, there are also social tipping points. I will not speak too much about that, but some of these are very well described by uh, in, books with the name tipping points. So I recommend this as well, but yeah, of course, uh, habits, clothes, customs, uh, whatever can change overnight. Few go dressed like this, uh, this guy in the seventies anymore. And this is also called, called memes, right? The cultural changes or cultural transmission that might flip from one year to an other, which could be a, a kind of social tipping points. Probably a better example is the smoking ban that of course was aided also by, uh, by a law. Uh, it was huge discussion and lots of resistance towards the, this smoking ban in public places. It would ruin the, the, uh, everything from restaurants to cafes and uh, yeah, it was really heavy warnings against this. And then it was then and the only thing that people asked uh, afterwards was why did we do this long time ago? And of course, there are lots of, of these kind of tipping points from the ban of the slavery to uh, human to, 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 to women rights, children rights, um, animal rights, uh, and of course there are probably even more obvious uh, technological tipping points from the internet to electric cars and, and so forth. And uh, I will not go into detail with this, but this is among the, the papers you've got to read. And I think this is a very elegant paper showing how uh, insights or awareness of the risk of uh, tipping points in nature and climate system uh, might provoke uh, and uh, put forward uh, social tipping points, uh, a multitude of, of different social tipping points that again might prevent some of the most dangerous tipping points in, in the natural systems. So of course, global change has arrived, although people are still not aware of this. I mean, we talk about climate uh, crisis, but it's still not perceived as a crisis. 
like Corona is. There is very interesting discussions. Why has not more changed? I mean, things are changing. There is a massive change in awareness these days, but still it's a pretty slow change compared to, to the very narrow window we have for, for change. And there are lots of um, climate psychological reasons for this. Uh, as an evolutionary biologist, I think there are lots of good things to say about humans. We are empathic and we are evolved for so social, <laughs> social life, etc. But we are probably not evolved for long-term decis decisions to Sacrifice goods today for the benefit of the coming generations is not of the things we are capable. Yeah, this frog is the metaphor of the shifting baselines. If you put the frog in cold water, I don't know if this has ever been done. Hopefully not. If you put it in cold water and heat it gradually, it will stay there until it's boiled because it doesn't really realize when it has reached the harmful and dangerous level. And mentally, this could be the way that also we humans behave. Then towards the end of, of my talk here, uh, and this is what I already said, that uh, it's a need for interactions between different disciplines, of course, it's incredibly important, but also interactions with society. I mean, natural sciences can describe the problem and, and uh, suggest some remedies, but the solutions require broad actions from different disciplines and, of course, also from society at large. Uh, and again, the point is, uh, how should we best link awareness uh, uh, about the, the climate risks and feedbacks uh, in a way that uh, promotes and provokes uh, social feedbacks of all kinds, from technology to social norms to investments, etc. Yeah, who is to blame or who have the solutions? It's not only the, the politics, of course, it's not only you and me, but we are part of this. So, I mean, it's we all have this responsibility, both as nations and individuals. But of course, it has to start with the political incentives. That's, that's obvious. And of course, the producers have a, a major role here, but the producers can shift uh, almost immediately they just uh, respond to the market and the market is us yeah uh, finally a few words about the current situation the covid-19 i i love this cartoon the two white coated guys looking at the covid-19 curves that we all discussed in springtime the flock immunity if you still recall that that we tried to achieve and not being aware of the tremendous uh, waves that are rising behind in terms of climate change and uh, and also loss of nature. Uh, and I think that's in a nutshell where we, uh, we are today. And uh, we might, we are certainly in a situation where there is a tipping point and uh, probably this have been even more obvious in these uh, days of COVID-19. And of course, when, when the planet, and uh, I mean, when society starts up again uh, at some time, we could either uh, return to business as usual, which eventually would turn us into a hot house earth, or we could use these incentives that we see these days, uh, probably also sparked by COVID-19 and turn it into a sustainable earth. But this requires a whole suit of societal tipping points. So I end this with uh, a wallpaper I saw in Bergen recently, which I think uh, to me in a very elegant way summarized this, that the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. And this is a message that holds for every one of us, but it also holds for, for instance, Norway as a nation that uh, we still have this kind of attitude that, well, China should deal with the climate Norway doesn't need to bother. Of course, Brazil uh, should deal with biodiversity, but Norway doesn't need to bother, which of course is a, a complete uh, wrong way of reasoning. And this is the tragedy of the common way of reasoning. That's why I love this, uh, this wallpaper. Yeah, uh, I'll stop there. And then as I understand, we will have some time for comments, discussions and questions afterwards. Thank you.